I think it's very good news for, uh, for the American people. I think it's good for Korea also because we continue the agreement. So I guess I would say you have to think of this as really three agreements that are independent but that define a relationship. So the first is CHORUS, which we're continuing, and I'll come back to that. The second is the steel agreement. So the Koreans have agreed to cut their steel shipments from their average shipments over the last three years by 30 percent. This is very, very important to American steelmakers. A lot of people believe, and I think I agree with them, that Korea is part of the problem on steel. They import a lot of Chinese steel and export a lot of steel to the United States. So that's part of it. The third part is this issue of currency, where the United States and Korea are wrapping up an agreement, which I think is very important, very historic agreement. As you know, we start from the proposition that we want stable currency. Secretary Mnuchin talked about that in, uh, in Buenos Aires over the weekend or last week. Uh, and then we move to this agreement, which provides for transparency and it for, uh, provides for an agreement not to have competitive devaluation. And then there's a whole process that really puts teeth into it. So now if I can go back to Chorus, what does Chorus do? The president's view has been that, and I agree with it, that Chorus has not been particularly good to the United States. We've had increases in trade deficits and really not substantial increases in sales. And that started to change last year, really because of what I call the Trump effect, people wanting to buy more from the United States to get trade deficits down. So in this agreement, we've done a number of things, the biggest of which is, one, we've agreed that we're not going to have a phase out of a 25 percent small truck tariff for 20 more years. This is very important. The Koreans don't ship trucks to the United States right now, and the reason they don't is because of this tariff. They were going to start next year. We would have seen massive truck shipments. So that's put off for two decades. On the issue of automobile sales to Korea, which is very important, right now there's a 25,000 per manufacturer limit during which you can use U.S. safety standards. We're increasing that to 50,000. That gives economy of scale. In addition, we're getting rid of a lot of the other barriers that our manufacturers have seen to actual sales in Korea. So we're, we're, we're changing the way we're going to look at the environmental standards, the way we're going to look at cafe standards, the way they're using customs to keep our products out. There's a whole variety of things in that area, in the auto area. And then there's a third area, which is customs and implementation improvements. And in that, one significant point is that our pharmaceutical manufacturers are going to be able to get the benefit of, of innovative uh, drug pricing in Korea, something that they've been precluded from. So I guess I'd say all three of these are very important. I think they're very historic when taken together, and we're, we're very proud of them, both at USTR uh, and at the Department of Treasury, but most importantly, the President's very so, pleased. Uh, Ambassador, how many, how many cars do we send over there now? Do we, do we send 25,000 over? Do, do they want our cars? What, what, what do, is doubling the limit matter if we're not sending over even 25,000 right now? Well, this is really a good question. Right now, one of the problems with the 25,000, it is so small that the manufacturers don't really put a lot of, uh, of emphasis on it. So we've sold up to about 13,000. There is a view that the manufacturers have that with a bigger number, they'll do better. But it's really important to focus on the fact that there are impediments. And we have really got rid of those impediments. For example, it was difficult to bring in parts to service the cars. Well, we've gotten rid of that. It was difficult to bring cars in because there were customs problems. There were uh, certification, verification of origin problems. There were a whole score of problems that we've taken on. And we think we're going to make real improvements. It's not going to go to 50,000 per manufacturer immediately. But I think it's going to get way above 25. And I think we're talking in the not too distant future about billions of dollars of additional sales. And I would say that, 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 that other countries do sell in there and we have the kind of products that they'll buy. This is great for, uh, obviously, the, to do this with South Korea. Now, what are the chances that, that they, what we're, you know, the stuff we're doing with China here, that, the, that it is much criticized by, by certain uh, people with, with the, the approach to uh, to taking a tougher stance there. Is it possible that it bears fruit? I mean, China is not South Korea, South Korea is not China. Is it possible something like this 
uh, something positive with a, a trade deal with China could come from avoiding tariffs that, that we're talking about right now? Well, it certainly is important. I mean, China is a far more significant uh, trade relationship also and geopolitical relationship. But, but, but let's take a step back. We have a $375 billion trade deficit in goods with China. That is unsustainable. They're almost half of our total problem. And how did they arrive at that? Some of it's economic activity, but a lot of it is non-economic activity. So it's, for example, forcing technology transfer. It is forcing people to license technology at less than, than, uh, than economic terms. It's state capitalism, that is to say, buying up U.S. technology in massive ways by the state. And it's, in fact, cyber theft. So the president asked us to take a look at this. Uh, back in August, we did a very thorough study, thousands and thousands of pages. We had a hearing. We put out a report, which I commend all of your readers. It's about 200 pages. It's a very thorough analysis of this. We have to remember that technology is an American competitive advantage, and it is the future of our economy. So we had to do something. So what did the president do? He decided to do something in a very measured way, in a very appropriate way. We studied what the costs are. We put the minimum, the minimum value we could. We had an algorithm, and we had professional people who developed that. And then those same people decided it was about a $50 billion at least cost from just part of what we determined and that they would put in place tariffs. So we have a process where the tariffs were basically arrived at through an algorithm. They're largely high technology things. We'll announce them before very long. And then we'll go through a 60-day period where we'll give the public a chance to comment on the good and the bad things okay. in there. Now, to get to your question, yes, I think there is hope. We have, a, we have two very different systems. We have one that's state capitalism and one that is a market economy driven. There's going to be a certain amount of tension between the two. But I think it's very possible that we can end up over a series of, um, over many years and over a series of, of, of difficulties, working our way to a good place. And this is the beginning of that process. All right, same question for NAFTA. I mean, uh, Navarro was on CNBC a couple of days ago and said it's possible that, that there might be some good things happening in the, in, with NAFTA and the deal that we're finally able, theoretically, to strike. Any, do you see any body language there to, to confirm that, what Navarro said? Well, well, I mean, I'm hopeful. First of all, we have to remind ourselves that uh, uh, that relationship is $1.2 trillion in trade. It is a huge relationship. It's a very complicated relationship. And it really has been very bad for the United States. Good for some sectors, but not good overall. So we're trying to rebalance. We're trying to modernize. And I guess at this point, I'd say I'm hopeful. I think we are making progress. I think that that all three parties want to move forward. We have a short window because of elections and things beyond our control. But if there's a real effort made to try to close out and to compromise and, and do some of the things we all know we should do, you know, I'm optimistic we can get something done right. in, in principle in the next little bit. Right, the final question, is the South Korea deal, is that open-ended or, or is, it, uh, is there a time schedule on that? No, I mean, because we, we are not going back to Congress, we had to do the legal framework that, we, that already exists. So that's a framework that is open-ended, but does allow the president the right on 180 days' notice to get out of the agreement if it's not working. But it's, it is an open-ended agreement. It is, okay. But you won't do that with NAFTA, and that, that's part of the problem, right? We will not do that. With NAFTA, and I would say it's not part of the problem. It's part of the beauty of the improvement. Oh, okay. We're going to be in a position where we where where we periodically look at whether or not this is in everyone's interest, and that's something. Look, there's no law, there's no there's no tax. Everything tends to be term limited, sunsetted, and it's something that okay. requires people to evaluate. And I think that's a very positive thing. Hey there, thanks for checking out CNBC on YouTube. Be sure to subscribe to stay up to date on all of the day's biggest stories. You can also click on any of the videos around me to watch the latest from CNBC. Thanks for watching.